because the challenges at home I see every week, like I do the bins in my house and there's a compost bin, there's a plastic and paper and then there's the, the bin bin. And it's every, challenging. Every, every week, household that's every got, week I bring him to that bins and the happy pair and I feel ashamed and guilty. I think of you, I think of you, waste is a lack of imagination. I'm like, oh, shut up. You know, I'm trying to quieten that voice, but you're there in my head every week. I'm like, I'm really imaginative. Why am I doing this? <laughs> well, this is a nice opportunity to kind of go from a more philosophical kind of commentary to a more literal commentary. Yeah. yeah. Um, so systems design uh, would be the kind of uh, big statement in terms of yes, how to... Give it not, to us, Doug. Give it to us. I like it. And what I can, I can articulate around literal system change... Um, from silo to a typical or an, uh, a similar size restaurant or whatever. Um, so Yoast, all credit to Yoast for having that sort of amazing vision as as sort of simple as it is. It's genius. Um, get things from nature, <laughs> maximize all those resources within the restaurant and then compost it. You know, very simplistic. Now, 95% of what would necessitate a bin falls under that umbrella. So 95% of what's coming into silo is food from farms. Um, vegetables. Vegetables. And inputs, uh, food inputs. Yeah. And so literally that's, you know, how we do it. And we get... So you're all, dealing direct with the farmer, not with dealing the with the producer. middle person, not dealing with the distributor. It's just direct relationships. But then when you really start to sift through everything a restaurant like needs. How do you find like a local you, grower a turmeric or a local grower exactly, a cumin seed? Exactly. How do you find like you, even a black pepper? The more you go deeper into uh, the logistics of everything a restaurant needs, the more you're like, oh, that doesn't make sense. I can't get that from a farm. I can't get a light bulb from a farm. You need a light bulb to, you know, light a restaurant, right? You need um, all kinds of things. Like what but it depends on floors. where you grow the rules because... You know, like you've gone to the tea where you're now, made, like uh, to the end degree, I mean, where you're, you've made tables out of mushrooms, you make, you know, you make plates out of the glass wine bottles. Like you are pushing this a lot further than most people. Like you, your rules of the game are more severe than other yeah. people might have imagined. Them. Or more sophisticated. Yeah. So two of the big sort of um, conundrums, um, kind of big kind of, um, the one material that remains the one single use material that remains in our system is single use glass. And that is because we don't grow. Um, there's, there's not enough production of natural wine in the UK and wine is a natural wine is a very significant part of our offering. Very significant. And it doesn't have to be, but I want it to be. And so it is inevitable that we have single use wine because it's not local. And furthermore, a wine list is, is made up of... This is the glass rather than the wine. And because most people like have this idea that I put my wine in the recycling box, my wine bottle gets recycled. But in reality, very little of it actually most gets recycled. Most ends yeah. up as cement, as aggregate for building materials. Plus, um, I think it's only something like one third of uh, this virgin glass gets recycled. The rest mm. goes to landfill. And in landfill, it takes 10,000 years to break down and excretes enormous amount of emissions in the process. So it's not good. Um, so we wanted to innovate there. But but even just to clarify, so because we may not come back to this, to innovate there, you've got a potter on your site above Mark. the restaurant, Mark the potter, who literally breaks the glass in a machine that crushes the glass. He puts it in, he turns it into plates. He's a potter that turns them into plates, turns them into glasses, and he's actually on site turning waste glass into usable, tangible inputs for your restaurant. Exactly. But I'd just like to take a tiny step before that innovation or that actual reality manifesting into Silo is that moment of like, what was different in Silo having that idea? Now it's a circumstance. It's a limitation. We've taken the bin away and said, we don't have a bin. And then we're forced to innovate. We've, we've, we've literally um, put ourselves in a position where, <laughs> you know, the press, are, the press are on us. You know, there's a lot of attention on Silo and we've not got a bin. We've taken that away. So we've got this unique creative opportunity to innovate. You know, we put that pressure on ourselves in a really fascinating way. And so when you're staring at this massive stack of 
single-use glass bottles and thinking, oh, I'm not sure this is the right thing here. How do we sneak these out of here without anyone seeing <laughs> exactly, it? Exactly. We can't. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we got to think about it, you know. But it forces creativity. It forces you to Boundaries. think in a way that marries your other set of values, which is a circular way of thinking. So with a circular way of thinking, how do you turn glass into the system in a way which is productive, efficient, and increasing the value of that process? You need to increase value, and I don't mean monetary value. That intervention needs to bear fruit. And so in my mind, by this point, this was um, this innovation was about four years into Silo in the UK. And I was sat on Brighton Beach and the beach has no sand. And I was thinking about this predicament of having single use glass and thinking, what is glass made out of? You know, going back to this sort of fundamental, oh, it's made out of silica sand or sand you know, in my mind at the time. And I was like, oh, what if we turned it back into sand ourselves? You know, just this free flowing kind of creativity. What if we turn it back into sand? Maybe we could rebuild beaches. Maybe we could, I don't know, turn it into something that we need. And that was the beginning of this thought process, followed by three days of searching the darkest place, you know, these kind of going deep into the internet, finding glass, going into glass crushing. <laughs> Turns out there's this one machine in New Zealand of all places that had built a glass crusher that crushed glass like a flour mill would mill flour. And uh, that was my description, not theirs. And when you have a uniformed particle consistency that this machine, machine created, it's like baking. If you milled flour and had these big lumps of wheat and small bits of flour, you're not going to bake a nice loaf of bread, are you? But if you have a perfect, even consistency of flour particles, you've got this consistent workable product. And I was like, oh, this is great. This is, you know, the juices are going, the, the cogs, are, cogs are in motion. So if we can mill glass like we mill flour... Again, that dyslexic brain connecting the dots between different subjects. Um, then we've got a raw material. And so we refer to it as raw glass, the project. So we crush glass into this powder and sand, different gradients. Um, and then I went to the local potter, Mark, and said, can you melt this in your kiln to turn it into things that we need? Plates, tiles, crockery, tableware, light fittings, um, a sink. And since we've spent the last six or seven years now making some of the most profoundly beautiful objects I've seen in my life. Mark is a wizard. He's, a, he's, a, he's an artist. He's a, 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 a stunning craftsman that turns yeah, our, our waste wine bottles into exquisite. It's kind of material that's in between marble and concrete. Um, but there's so much um, creative flair in this material and you have to see it. Yeah, yeah. I remember well, you have seen it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> the spoons. Remember the spoons. It was like, it was nearly like bone. Porcelain. Yeah, porcelain. porcelain. Or ivory. Yeah, like, yeah. It was like, yeah. wow, this is. But that demonstrates that thinking in circles um and i think that's i think like that's one what's of, important like the most um creative parts of nature nature are the boundaries the edges and by you removing the bin you have self-imposed a really difficult Hard. boundary which forces you to create in a different manner to what most people are and most people are that we all see creativity we want to be creative people but one of the keys to creativity, ironically, is restriction, constraint, yeah. opposition, 